Brought to you by Wondrium. The waterways of ancient Egypt teemed with crocodiles, an apex predator that can grow up to 6 meters in length. Nile crocodiles are ambush hunters. This means that they lie in wait, ready to snatch anything that strays too close. Some ancient Egyptian piloting a papyrus boat or bringing laundry to the riverbank had to be on constant lookout for crocodiles who might leap out of the water to drag them to their deaths. Many ancient Egyptian stories include scenes in which a crocodile eats an unsympathetic cat character, and one of the most fearsome monsters in Egyptian mythology, Amit, is an amalgam of Egypt's most dangerous animals, the hippo, the lion, and the crocodile. But the ancient Egyptians did not just fear crocodiles, they also worshipped them, especially in the form of the god Sobek. But why? Why would they celebrate, even feed and care for, the animal they feared most? And who is Sobek anyway? In this video, we'll consider the origins, beliefs, and practices surrounding Sobek in order to better understand why he was so important to ancient Egyptian religion. Along the way, we'll also explore questions of what makes a god powerful and how the ancient Egyptians reconciled the terrifying dangers of the natural world with their belief in the supremacy of the gods. You may have seen depictions of Sobek before. If you've ever seen an Egyptian god with the body of a human and the head of a crocodile, that's Sobek. He was the quintessential crocodile god of ancient Egypt. You might be tempted to ask, what was Sobek the god of? It's only natural to wonder, since it's common for Egyptian gods to be described in this way. Geb is the god of the earth, Nut is the goddess of the sky, etc. etc. However, not all Egyptian deities can be defined in simplistic terms of a single domain. Sobek is one such example. In the places where he was worshipped, he was supreme, the giver of life in abundance, the bringer of the annual Nile Flood, a source of protection from danger. His personality was not tied to a single characteristic, but included all of the benefits he provided to those who worshipped him. Now, if you really needed to define Sobek's personality in terms of a single characteristic, it would need to be the god of appetite. Just like real-life crocodiles, Sobek would eat nearly anything he could get a hold of. In the story of the murder of Osiris, the trickster god Seth cut up his brother's body and scattered the pieces throughout Egypt. Always hungry for anything edible that might float by, Sobek ate a piece of Osiris' body. He was punished for the crime by having his tongue cut out. The story serves as an etiology, or mythical explanation, for the fact that crocodiles don't seem to have tongues. Well, technically crocodiles do have tongues. They're tongues are held to the bottoms of the mouth by a membrane and don't move freely, so ancient observers thought they didn't have one at all. The story characterizes Sobek as unable to control his hunger. Not even the gods were safe while any part of them was within range of his jaws. Meanwhile, Sobek's sexual appetites were the stuff of legend. In various funerary texts, women and goddesses literally throw themselves at Sobek. He was so virile that they simply could not resist him. One of his epithets is Neb Metu, the Lord of Semen. I would show the hieroglyph on screen, but it's explicit enough that I think YouTube would demonetize this video if I did. This is a title not many would want to ascribe to themselves today, but one which characterized Sobek to the ancient Egyptians as being especially masculine and powerful. He was also known as he who steals wives from their husbands, an epithet that almost seems to have been taken from modern meme culture. Generally, Sobek was associated with the natural world. He was responsible for the annual Nile flood, perhaps even the creator of the Nile itself. Naturally, it was assumed that his creative energies applied to procreation as well. In a sense, every crocodile in Egypt was a child of Sobek, and since there's a lot of crocodiles around, as anyone could see, he must have been very busy fathering them all. It's probably no accident that Sobek was associated with these two basic biological urges, food and sex. Aside from these appetites, his personality is something of a blank. Perhaps it could even be called reptilian. Unlike other Egyptian deities who have rich, human-like personal characteristics, Sobek was simple. He brought good things such as abundant crops, but he mostly wanted to eat and make babies. And perhaps it was in this regard that he was a relatable god. Despite his terrifying appearance and aloof personality, many people can relate to these basic animal drives. The origins of Sobek are shrouded in mystery but he probably dates to prehistoric times. Belief in Sobek originated in the area of the Fayum Oasis, a large inland lake west of the Nile Valley, which is fed by a branch of the river. The Fayum is an area of marshes
marshes and fertile farmland, cut off from the main course of river traffic along the Nile. Crocodiles were abundant there in ancient times, and the people there saw them as a symbol of the power of the natural world. As the chief god of a relatively isolated region, worship of Sobek probably flourished in local temples for centuries before his rise to prominence as a central god in the Egyptian pantheon. It may seem strange to us that the ancient Egyptians would focus so much devotion on a deadly animal, whose crocodile children might be waiting in the shadows to kill and eat you at any moment, but this is actually well in line with other Egyptian beliefs. Several Egyptian gods were associated with potentially deadly animals. Sekhmet the lioness, Serket the scorpion, Wadjet the snake, and Tawaret the hippo, just to name a few. The Egyptians believed that the deadliness of these creatures is what made them powerful. A dangerous creature can become a great ally when its aggression is redirected against your enemies. The Egyptians understood the interaction between power and danger. Anything with the power to do good might also cause harm, depending on the target of its power. Sobek fits perfectly within this understanding. As a representation of the natural world and basic biological drives, he embodied both the dangers and benefits of living in a hostile environment. By worshiping him and making crocodiles into allies, the Egyptians could benefit from his powerful appetites, which they themselves shared. But the pursuit of these things can lead to danger. Understanding and addressing those dangers in the form of a god may have been a way of coping with them. The first preserved mention of Sobek comes from the pyramid texts, collections of magic spells and religious hymns carved on the inside of some pyramids, dating to the Old Kingdom. There, Sobek is identified as the son of Neat, a goddess of hunting from the Delta region. Since Sobek was known as a voracious predator, it makes sense that his mother would also be a skilled hunter. Like the Fayum, the Delta was a land of marshes and greenery. The similarity of Neat and Sobek's native habitats might help to explain their familial connection in Egyptian mythology. The pyramid texts connect Sobek with the city of Shedyet for the first time. Shedyet, later known to the Greeks as Crocodilopolis or Crocodile City, was the urban heart of the Fayum region, and the center of worship for Sobek from a time before written evidence. In later times, worship of Sobek would spread to other parts of Egypt, especially the Delta and Kom Ombo in Upper Egypt. But his story begins in the Fayum. During the Middle Kingdom, specifically the 12th dynasty, the capital of Egypt was located in Ech Tawi, a city near the entrance to the Fayum. The pharaohs of this period began the first of many state-run projects to increase the agricultural productivity of the Fayum region. These projects were huge even by modern Modern standards. They involved draining marshy areas to expand cropland and building up the urban infrastructure of the entire region. As part of this large-scale land reclamation project, the pharaoh Amenemhat III built temples throughout the Fayum that focused on the worship of local deities. The largest and grandest was in the city of Shedyet at the center of the Fayum. There, Amenemhat built and expanded on earlier sites to create a huge temple to the crocodile god, complete with a pool at the center for the children of Sobek. Ancient sources describe a massive crocodile living in the temple, adorned with crowns and necklaces. In other words, a living god. This pampered crocodile was probably raised from the egg to trust humans and not harm them. Instead, it dined on meat, bread, and beer every single day, the sort of rich food that very few humans could afford to eat themselves most of the time. When the crocodile died, it was given a king's funeral. The crocodile itself was mummified and buried in a temple. Amenemhat also built a temple in the city of Ja, today known as Medinet Mahdi. The temple is ostensibly dedicated to Renanutet, a goddess of the harvest, sometimes considered the wife of Sobek, but it's her husband who gets most of the royal attention in the temple inscriptions. Amenemhat also built a pyramid near the city of Shedyet at a place now called Hawara. The mortuary cult of the king was tightly connected to the temple at Shedyet and veneration of Sobek. This explosion of religious architecture shows how prominent Sobek was in the Fayum at this time. In order to build goodwill with the people, the Middle Kingdom pharaohs unapologetically made everything about Sobek. Pharaohs also strengthened their own ties to Sobek by emphasizing his connection to Horus, the god of kingship. In texts from the Middle Kingdom onward, Sobek is identified as Horus in the Fayum. The the idea seems to be that Horus, upon entering the Fayum, took on the form of Sobek, as though they were a single god in different guises. So this is some clever theological maneuvering. All of the worship of Sobek, which had been going on for millennia, also supported the king and royal government. The people of the Fayum thus became diehard royalists simply by doing something they've always done 
worshipping the crocodile, and their support had earthly rewards. As a result of royal attention, the Fayum prospered. During this time, a relationship was established between Sobek and Rey, which also linked him to Horus through Rey Harakti, whose name means Rey, Horus of the Horizon. Not only was Sobek associated with the Nile, its annual flood, the agricultural wealth of the Fayum, and the king himself, now he even caused the sun to rise in the morning. His fame had reached a new height. Never again would Sobek be a regional crocodile god. He had become one of the greatest gods of Egypt. The special attention paid to Sobek during the Middle Kingdom made him a national celebrity, but the decline in royal attention after the end of the 12th dynasty caused his popularity to wane slightly in the following centuries. Nevertheless, he remained a central part of the Egyptian pantheon. Books of the dead dating to the New Kingdom call upon Sobek to fight on behalf of the dead and the afterlife. Votive texts from the area of Thebes address Sobek directly, calling him beautiful and beneficial, and asking him to intercede for the living and the dead. During the Ptolemaic period, developing the Fayum once again became a central project of the state. Land grants to Greek mercenaries who served the Ptolemies meant that many non-Egyptian people were moving into the Fayum, and it became necessary to shore up the region's traditional culture in order to maintain public order. The temple complex at Shedyet, now called Crocodilopolis, was expanded and new cities were built on the Greek model. Sobek once again rose to national prominence. Worship of the crocodile at Kom Ombo in Upper Egypt reached its height during this time. The temple itself was a grand building project, which overtly united Sobek and Horus under one roof a double temple both to Horus and Sobek. Here mummification of crocodiles became a major industry. Here are two giant specimens on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Private citizens could offer crocodile mummies to Sobek in exchange for his help in life. In order to meet the demand, thousands of crocodiles were raised in captivity and even hunted in the wild. Even after he became connected with the king and the royal court, Sobek remained accessible to people from all walks of life. Texts from the Middle Kingdom throughout Egypt revealed that common people prayed to Sobek for aid and protection. One prayer from the late period has fishermen calling out to Sobek for protection from crocodiles, saying, Don't lift your face, you fish and crocodiles in the water, until Osiris has passed by you. The prayer is a clear reference to the story of Sobek eating part of Osiris, warning him of the punishment that awaits him if a crocodile eats the speaker of the spell, who has identified himself as Osiris. Today, the Nile crocodiles of Egypt are all but gone, surviving only in the man-made Lake Nasser after the construction of the Aswan High Dam in the 1960s. Although this dam conquered the age-old dangers of the yearly Nile floods, it trapped these ancient creatures from where they once roamed. Egyptians can now walk the banks of the Nile without fear of being attacked by terrifying human-eating crocodiles. But in antiquity, Sobek's children were everywhere and their basic but relatable drives made Sobek a figure of veneration throughout Egyptian history. Though his prominence on the national stage rose and fell with the changes in royal attention, he never ceased to be a source of comfort for his people. The terrible violence that crocodiles threatened was understood as one part of a dangerous natural environment, where animals could threaten a person's life and where uncontrollable natural events could mean feast or famine. Sobek was an ally to his people, who could bring his terrible power to the battle against life's uncertainties. Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring today's video. From the folks who brought you The Great Courses Plus, Wondrium is an educational platform where you can find long and short form videos, tutorials, documentaries, and more. And if you're a fan of ancient Egypt in particular, Wondrium has a very impressive selection. For example, Wondrium offers a series on learning how to write and read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's 24 lectures long, which is almost as long as an entire college semester. I'm particularly a fan of their series, A Guided Tour of Ancient Egypt. It's taught by the Egypt Egyptologist Dr. Melinda Hartwig, who is the ancient Egyptian art curator at Emory University's museum. What I love about this series is that it's very targeted. Each lecture focuses on a specific structure, a specific site, or a specific city. Do you want to learn about the Stepped Pyramid of Djoser? What about the city of Abydos, the religious center of Osiris, or the Temple of Amun-Re at Karnak? This series dedicates an entire 30-minute lecture to each one of these sites and more, which I think is a very good way to learn about ancient Egypt.
Egypt. I've spent the last year in Egypt as a postdoctoral researcher, and I can honestly say that I wish I had discovered the series before I traveled there. I would have gotten a lot more out of my site visits. If you want to give Wondrium a try and dive deep into some of these topics, Wondrium is offering a free trial for the Religion for Breakfast audience. Visit wondrium.com slash religion for breakfast or click on the link in the show notes below to start your free trial today. Thanks, Wondrium.